calls her the handmaiden of the Lamb. She is called the pietist and leader of pastoral work, one of 37 women who changed the world, a pioneer of the Moravian church, an <coughs> activist, a Moravian form mother, a woman of courage and valor, a preacher, a priest, and maybe even a bishop. Next slide. So if you may recognize this, I had the pleasure of meeting the busy workers and the Anna Nichman dolls last Wednesday before I got sick. Um, and I just wanted to show this as an example of the reverence in which Anna Nichman is held to this day. The care and exquisite handiwork that go into these beautiful dolls just to me exemplify what she means, but we still don't know who she is. So all of these labels certainly work to promote the first part of the puzzle that I outlined above, namely Anna Nichman as a legend and as an icon for female leadership and piety within both the Moravian church and also in the context of the 18th century. Respected scholars before me have stumbled over this stone, believe me. Scholars you may recognize the names of, such as Beverly Smaby, Peter Falkt, Martin Jung, Peter Zimmerling, Lucinda Martin, all have seen in Anna Nichman a figure that deconstructs the traditional notion of women's agency in the 18th century. Not a passive heroine who allows things to happen to her, Anna is a doer, truly a mover and a shaker, which is probably why the papers were destroyed. At a time where to be a single woman in society meant either destitution, servitude, or cloistering, Anna Nichman refused marriage multiple times so that she could follow what she felt called to do, namely provide spiritual guidance to women, especially young women. And her efficacy in this calling can be measured by, as Beverly Smaby has pointed out, the success of the single sisters' choir in the mission congregations, especially here in Bethlehem. As you probably know, originally there was not supposed to be a single sister's choir here in Bethlehem. Schwangenberg forbade it. He said, no, we are not going to have a single sister's choir. But what Schwangenberg didn't reckon with is Anna Nichman's success. Whenever she met young women, whether it was Margarita Bechtel in Philadelphia or any of the other women here in the colonies, they wanted to come and join her and do what she did. Her success in attracting single women from the colonies meant that there had to be a single sister's choir. <coughs> and those single sisters were not to be brought over in a boat <coughs> from Europe, but rather were homegrown. They were American young women. So what I'd like to start with is to look at Anna's life as she depicted it herself in her much cited but much neglected memoir. Most biographies <coughs> that have been published on her draw heavily on the document. But reading it through, several questions come to mind immediately. First, why did she write her memoir at this point? 1737 is the year in which she is now part of the Sinsendorf family entourage, and which has been exiled from Saxony, and is experiencing the challenges of the Bonnevoy, which I'll talk about in a minute. <coughs> also, according to tradition, this is the same year, and I need Paul's help here, um, in which Sinsendorf asked Anna's father to adopt him so that he and Anna could travel together as brother and sister without incurring any gossip. Not that that helped. <laughs> I don't know how to look for So is that true? That's true. Yes. Wow. <coughs> the memoir is a 26-page manuscript, which is long for a woman author in the Moravian ladies' love tradition of the 18th century, and it is interspersed with poetry and hymns. In fact, reading it through, I think of the Moravian tradition of the Singstunde, where thoughts are expressed in musical form to be shared by all present. There are 10 instances in the document where Anna expresses her emotions in verse, in hymns. Her memoir begins in an almost pastoral mode, describing her early years where she would be sent out <coughs> into the fields to tend sheep and would sing hymns to herself. Hymns, of course, are interesting as a form, as a genre, because they allow both an individual and a communal emotion to come together, that to be expressed in common. And to me, this is a significant indication of Anna's expressive lyrical style, 
It manifests itself later in her success as a hymn writer and is repeated in her recently discovered sermons, which Paul discovered in 1998, I think, um, to the single sisters. Her personal experiences of doubt, faith, joy, are all expressed in a form that others can participate in. From her memoir, we know that she was born on November 24, 1715, in Kunewald in Moravia, and the daughter of David and Anna Nijman. Um, I love this picture. Look at the size of his hands. It's amazing. This man is, this man is a doer, right? Um, and uh, yes, so the next slide. I'm nervous about this one. I'm sure Paul is going to look at this and sort of say, well, Katie, hold on, let me just check that here. It's very difficult to work out the family tree of the Nichmans. That's very complicated. So um, I've tried to try uh, to pull them um, into separate pieces here. And if you can read the text at the bottom, her whole family was connected to the Simpson North household in some way. And of course, through her forebears, they are all, they, they claim to have been followers of the original Unitas Platon as well. Um, her elder brother Melchior uh, Lichmann was imprisoned frequently for his activities, his Protestant activities. Her father also. Um, there are tales of um, them both escaping from prison and um, miraculously the locks opening and the watchmen being blinded so that they could escape prison. Her father was in the service um, of Sinzendorf and, as you know, was one of the founders of Bethlehem. And he was also one of the first missionaries with Anna's mother to St. Croix, where her mother died. Um, David Nitchman, as you know, died here in Bethlehem. He was very little of um, Her brother Melchior was imprisoned in Moravia and died for his beliefs, having emigrated to Helm also. Her brother Johann, whose journals and letters I need to look at, because I think there's a lot of information in there about Anna, um, that wasn't destroyed. He studied in Halle, and he became Sinzendorf's secretary. So he witnessed an awful lot of what was going on in the Sinzendorf household, and I'm very interested to look at his, um, his papers. Um, Johann worked as a missionary in Lapland, in England, in Ireland, and in Latvia, and he became a bishop in 1758. Um, her sister was Ina, emigrated from Moravia with her husband, and she died in hell. And so the whole of that side of the family, probably this side too, are all deeply embedded within the tradition of the Moravian show. <coughs> in her memoir, she speaks of visiting her father in prison when she was only eight years old and singing hymns to him and her brother for fortitude. Her family's escape to Helmwood was the stuff of movies. Her imprisoned father miraculously escapes his cell when he finds the locks open and the guards blinded to his escape. Although she writes of herself at the time before 1730, when she is a young teenager, is lost. During her own, what we say in German, the Denkliche Jahre, the troublesome years, adolescence, we might call it, she hears her brother Melchior praying at night, and this awakens in her a desire to win souls to the Savior, as she calls it. So at this point, she describes herself as gathering other young girls together, and she is also elected to the office of elders of the congregation. She writes, and this is my translation of her German, in this year, I moved away from my parents, something I could never have decided to do out of respect for them. But I realized that it was most fitting for my office, and thus did so with their permission. And so on January 26, 1733, I moved into the so-called Virgin's House, Jungfern House, with 13 single sisters. There I was very content. We lived cordially among ourselves, and many nights were spent in prayer." End of quote. Although things start out well, unfortunately there are soon problems in this new single sister's house. Quote, initially we lived in a shared community of goods. Later, though, certain things began to happen. Some of them became suspicious. And so love and unity were destroyed, end of quote. It seems as though several of the sisters were against Anna Nichman, and she can only express her predicament to the Savior. But despite these problems, her commitment to the leadership of the Single Sisters Choir is proven by her repeated refusal to enter into marriage. In 1733, because of the death of the chief elder and the absence of his newly elected replacement, Leon Pat Dorba, Anna assumes the position of chief elder of the church. 
1733. She's 18. According to Sinsendorf, Anna's activities as an 18 year old included guiding the spiritual affairs of the brethren, as well as the sisters, concerning herself with questions of doctrine, casting deciding votes in conferences, and instructing those assuming office. She also had to confirm candidates for communion, give a parting blessing to the dying, and perform much of the pastoral work of a minister. And all of that according to Adelaide Priest and her work on Anna Nichman. Next slide. In 1734, Anna Nichman became a companion to Philippe von Sinsendorf, who was 10 years her junior, and thereby came even closer to the Sinsendorf family. In her memoir, she writes, this was a difficult move for her, as she had to leave the solitude of her little room, a Stübchen, in the single sister's house and join the company of the nobility. But she complies, as she sees it is the Lord's will. And the following year, marriage was proposed for her with Leonhard Dorber, but because of a mutual reluctance, not just her, also he, these plans were abandoned. In a desire to educate herself further within the concepts and history of pietism and mysticism, Anna befriended Steinhof and Oettinger, two Württemberg pietists who were visiting Helmut at the time, and began her study of Madame de Guillon and Saint Teresa of Avila. By her own account, these readings of these mystical writers tempted her to follow a contemplative life that she would also become another Saint Teresa. But apparently, it was Sinsendorf who said to her, no, I want you to be a woman who lives a life of Christian action. Next slide. <coughs> so what did this action look like? In 1736, on Sinsendorf's exile from Saxony, Anna Nitschmann joined his pilgrim congregation and, as Benigna's companion, followed the family to the Bonneborg in Mediterranean. In 1737, a year in which Anna traveled extensively with the Sinsendorf family, the Count apparently took the unusual step, as I mentioned before, of requesting Anna's father to adopt him as a son, and so that he and Anna could call each other brother and sister. David Nishman complied, and that's where her lady's love ends. So everything after that, so everything up until that, you can sort of say, look at her lady's and that's what most biographers have done, is to take the ladies <coughs> up till she's 22, embellish it, add a few things, bits and pieces, um, and and then go from there. As I said, there's no modern translation of Anna Nitschmann's memoir. I would love to translate that and publish it. It's about time someone did it, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? Yeah, that's standard. <laughs>